on Voice of the Sea. We're seeing fresh water from new perspectives as we take a look at some of the Water Resources Research Center's work to better understand the unique water and wastewater management problems that we face in the Pacific. We start off with Leah Bremer at the Kako'o O'ivi Lo'i in Kane'oe to see how Kalo wetland restoration has sparked cultural and social renewal, including native species revival and cleaner water in the bay. We call it WRC. We're a, a research institute. They have WRCs all over the country. There's 52 different WRC centers and the UH one I'm a part of and we have researchers that research many different dimensions of water, including water quality, water quantity, different sources of contamination. My work really focuses on watershed conservation and the links between land management and water resources. We have mainly natural scientists, but also some social scientists, including economists on the team. You know, all over the world, there's a real interest in agricultural systems that provide multiple benefits. So aren't just about producing food, which can also often have all of these trade-offs. There's a real interest in how do we support agricultural systems that provide many benefits. And, and Kako Ivi is really at the kind of forefront of that in Hawaii with restoring traditional agriculture that clearly has a food production benefit, but also has really important cultural value, reconnecting people to place and providing many opportunities for people to really connect to land here. And then there's also a clear ecological benefit in terms of um, cleaning water and retaining sediment and providing habitat for IO. I think this is, you know, it's, this is a great partnership and in conjunction with the Water Resources Research Center to do kind of research that's directly applicable to the community. There's only about, say, seven acres right now that are in production, but the future, thinking about into 20 years, we're thinking about at least a couple of acres a year opening up towards a goal of the total is about 100 acres, but only about half of it would actually be in production because the other half will need to be roads and, and corridors and other ways to access it. it. My background is natural resources and environmental management. At UHERO specifically, which is my organization, UH Economic Research Organization, we focus on kind of the local environmental policy questions and local natural resource management questions, questions about the economic potential of their actions. You know, I guess before I worked here, I always thought about lo'i and, and producing kalo as, you know, it's very expensive. Is it really scalable for Oahu and, and for these areas? And kind of looking at the numbers and especially when you factor in Kako Weavy's family model where the volunteer families come out on the weekend, they have their own lo'i that they're responsible for and they're able to bring that food home. That really reduces the cost that Kako Weavy has to expend and so that makes it even more sustainable and that's why actually in the long term you see more profitability because the more families that come in, the more cost savings you have and that is a very unique model that I haven't seen done in Hawaii or really anywhere and so they really have have this great idea that hopefully can be replicable in other places. What I got to do was essentially just go into the lo'i with them. We spent two or three hours out there just talking story and having a good time and I would just help them malama the aina essentially and also just ask them about what benefits they get from being out here. Not just the food but also mentally and socially and culturally. A lot of them don't have access to a space like this or a resource like this to be able to perpetuate their culture in this way. It would also lead to other cultural perpetuation as well. So not just being able to makahana kaike or come out here and work with their hands in this practice, but pounding their own poi and kui and everything like that. And then they would also get exposed to just a connectedness between each other and a groundedness to this aina that they don't normally get during their day-to-day -day lives. I work for the Nature Conservancy, and so we've been here for, I think, eight years now. And my role out here is to document the changes to the bay and to the coastal waters and the stream waters through this restoration process. 
understanding how much sediment can build up in those lo'i, how much the water can be cleaned through that system, how the bay can respond, because Kaneohe Bay and the fish pond are right down, downstream, and how the nutrients, right? So we have a whole suburban development right above us, how the nutrient profiles will change as it moves through all this beautiful farm. And this instrument that we're standing in front of helps you to do some of that work? It does help me to do some of this work. It's a combination of a weather station and water quality instruments in the Awai itself. There's a turbidity sensor which measures how clear the water is every 15 minutes. There's wind and rain sensors so that I know how much water is moving through this system. And a water level sensor so that I know how full the Awai is at all the time, how much water is being used by the system. The overarching goal is to, we're going back to the back to the future, I don't know, <laughs> or forward to the past. We look at that, that, those old photographs of this place under production, and you're looking at 250 acres of taro. The amount of food that can come out of that is tremendous. On just a food system level, there's a huge potential for food production here. We also have, you know, 100 plus acres on the hillsides for agroforestry production. What I would love to see is a combination of commercial production, but also subsistence production. And so one of the things that we've tried to develop is a, um, we've called it the Ohana Lo'i Adoption Program. And we're trying to bring in families. It's kind of like a community garden, mm -hmm. but they're taking care of an individual taro patch. We take care of all the infrastructure around it, the waterways, the roads, et cetera. Um, the banks and they just take care of what's in the patch and the idea is that we provide this basically for free to the to the families and they share the harvest with us as an organization so they get to take home some to eat and then they give some to the organization and then we can incorporate that into our commercial production like a hybrid model uh -huh. it's not just commercial production it's not just the economic bottom line it's how can we both provide economic opportunity for people, but a place where people can come and practice their culture, engage in being outside. A lot of the families that come to our program, they're not farmers. They're, they have their regular jobs and their regular lives, but they love coming here on the weekends. Can you tell me about the collaboration that you have going on with the University of Hawaii researchers, like the Water Resources Research Center folks? I, I think it's really important understanding what, what we're doing in terms of ecosystem services. I mentioned that we're seeing water quality improvements. That's not my expertise. I just grow the taro. But if somebody else is there doing some quantitative analysis of the impacts of our practices, that's going to help us figure out what the best management practices are on the farm side. They also have been doing some interviews with our family program participants. That's been really cool to look at some of the social impacts of what we're doing. And then they're also doing economic studies, trying to figure out, OK, this is what where we're at in terms of production and labor costs now. How does that look as we start scaling up? Um, so it's really it's, it's actually really important for our long term management strategies and goals. Stuff like that. So we're, I'm, I'm grateful to have have them helping us. University of Hawaii's Sea Grant College program focused on Hawaii's coasts and its communities through sustainable development, safe seafood supply, sustainable coastal tourism, hazard resilience, and healthy coastal ecosystems. Hawaii's Sea Grant. with engineering professor Roger Babcock. His research looks at the movement of water into cracks in sewer pipes. The leaks allow groundwater, rainwater, and seawater to enter the sewer pipes, straining our wastewater treatment system. So we know that there's gonna be sea level rise. At some day it's gonna be one foot, and then it's gonna be two foot, and three foot, and, and six feet, or something, 10 feet. And 
our sewers are going to be there for 100 years. So something is going to happen during the lifespan of these sewers. So we need to be thinking about it now when we build infrastructure that's going to be in there so long. So there's an equation to model flow through a, through a crack in a pipe. And so this is the equation we use. Q means flow rate, so that's the amount of water flowing in. And it's per foot of pipe length of sewer pipe. It is a function, a very important function of the what we call the soil hydraulic conductivity. That's how fast water can flow through soil. So if the pipe is in sand, sandy soil, water flows through really fast. If it's in clay, you don't really have a problem because water really can't flow through clay. So that's the K. And then the head, that's the, that's the depth of groundwater above the pipe. So that's really important H, OK? And the other stuff is where is, the, where is the defect or the crack and how big is it? So what we did then is we, we did some case studies. So the first case study that I'll show you is downtown Honolulu. Uh -huh. So dots are manholes and the, all the little lines connecting them are sewers. This figure here shows how much pipes are affected, the length of pipe affected oh. as sea level rises. So some of the pipes right now are not in, in groundwater but they're gonna be. So this shows kind of the increasing trend as time goes on and we have sea level rise. We don't know what the year is, but we know we'll have it. And so we can see that right now there's a few couple thousand feet affected. You know, as, as time really goes on and we get up to nine or 10 feet, which is the higher end predictions, then we're up to maybe almost a quarter of the sewer pipes are, are affected in a place like downtown Honolulu. So if you use the, mod, the equation then, you can calculate for all those pipes in downtown Honolulu, as a function of sea level rise in feet, the amount of flow that we would get. They're grouped into kind of sets of three based on percentage of pipes affected. So this is the 5% affected line, so maybe all the pipes are pretty new. So if you were to really maybe re do a massive replacement project, you might be able to fall on this line. Uh -huh. If you got a bunch of old pipes and 75% affected, then it's this much steeper curve. From downtown Honolulu, the sewage goes to Sand Island Wastewater Treatment Plant. And it's a very large plant. It's the largest plant in the state. And it treats currently 62 million gallons a day as its average flow, average daily flow. But when it rains, it can treat up to 240 million gallons a day. Oh my and God. actually, just recently, when Hurricane Lane was here, they got to 200 or to somewhere in that range to 240. I think they got to the point where they can't measure anymore, so it goes to, to 240. So just to keep those numbers in perspective, if we think about this sea level rise, and even in the mild, you know, the smallest case we considered, with three feet, you know, we've got three million gallons a day. Nine feet, we've got 23 million gallons a day. So that's a lot of water in comparison to this average. And that would all be water that's not didn't need to be sewage, it didn't need to be treated, um, and it's very expensive to, to treat that. If you look at other cases, you actually are going way into their capacity. And we're not gonna have all sealed sewers. That's, that's just not really uh, an option. And so we're always gonna have this, this infiltration. Unless we bring all our sewer pipes above ground, we could drive around them or have them elevated, you know, uh, but not likely. So. Uh, we're going to you know, have to deal with this, with this situation. And there's been some numbers put out about the value of this infrastructure, like sewer pipes, and, and you hear numbers that are in billions or many, many billions of dollars of, uh, of value, numbers that you can't even, that seem weird, like trillions of dollars. <laughs> and and uh, so you know, it's very, very expensive infrastructure, and it's, it's, it's expensive because it's buried kind of deep below the ground, so it's difficult to get to. We have to kind of think about what we should be doing now in order to be ready for the future. We don't want to have to dig things up too many times. Next, we're with engineering graduate student Adrian Fung, learning about the problem of groundwater leaking into sewer pipes. Our goal is to quantify the amount of groundwater that's infiltrating into the sanitary sewer system. So we have this mathematical model, and there's that Q variable in it, which is the amount of groundwater going in. So the first step in calibrating the model is to actually get data. So that includes going into the field and setting up some equipment. 
So this is an example of a flow meter. There are different types. Um, so this one, you can hook it up to a sensor, and it can measure velocity and level. And then you can use those to calculate a flow, which is a volume per time. So what you do is you <laughs> pop open the manhole, and somebody with confined space entry certification will go down there and install basically a ring in the pipe and then there's that velocity reader at the bottom and so as the water goes over that that reader that sensor it measures the velocity and the level it's actually pretty cool to see because there's a tripod that goes over the manhole and that person is kind of like dangled harnessed lowered down into the manhole and you have a spotter and you have to have a gas meter to keep uh, reading the meter, the gas continuously to make sure the area surrounding the person is safe. The ones we use were wireless. All we really have to do is just bring our laptop close enough to the manhole. You can keep it closed and everything. And then you just log in and it'll kind of like search around like Bluetooth and look for that, the flow meter down there. Once the laptop links up to the flow meter, then you can download the data from like the past day or the past week or something. Then you can clear it and then uh, have it take more measurements. And you can also use that to like get real-time data. So once it's hooked up, you can see like right now, what's the velocity, what's the level. Did you have any idea before you started working on this project that groundwater is coming into sewage pipes at, at such a rapid rate? Right, no, I did not. The thing is, it's happening all underground and it's hard to see. Um, it's just, you don't think about it because it's just the groundwater going into the pipe below, but it's actually a pretty substantial number and it's something that folks, especially in planning and engineering, need to be thinking about. That's the really interesting part, like thinking about the connection between the ocean and the groundwater and our daily lives. We are looking for a few heroes mentors, trailblazers, innovators, a passion to change lives, spark curiosity, open hearts, and awaken minds, help students answer the question, who am I? This could be your calling, but this is no job. It's the journey of a lifetime. Be a hero. Be a teacher. Welcome back. We're looking deep underground with geochemist Don Thomas, who has recently discovered new sources of Hawaiian water, 10,000 feet below sea level. His research indicates that the groundwater stores of fresh water within the Hawaiian Islands are much more complicated than originally believed. What I've really spent a lot of time working on is, is drilling poured boreholes. These are boreholes where we recover 100% of the geology as we drill down. And we found that, in fact, by doing the core drilling and recovering the geology, we have you know, really fundamentally new information coming out of that work. The groundwater flow and storage is much more complex than we had anticipated. And one of the most striking and unexpected findings was that we drilled to a depth of three and a half kilometers, 11,500 feet. Uh, we found fresh water that extended down as deep as 10,000 feet below sea level. Wow. And that changed our entire understanding of groundwater within the island. To have water 10,000 feet below sea level said that we had to have much more groundwater accumulating within Mauna Kea than we'd formerly realized. And so that has led to uh, some additional drilling. And in fact, we have found uh, groundwater within Mauna Kea that extends uh, to elevations of about 4,600 feet above sea level. What this does is it helps us you know, better maintain the resource and sort of change our thinking about you know, how to regulate the resource, how to manage the resource, and maybe even ways that we can better develop the resource with fewer impacts. 
the good news, at least for Hawaii Island, is that there's vastly more freshwater stored within the island than we realized. The sort of not so good news, as, as I was alluding to, is that it's not all flowing where we thought it was, and we need to rethink some things in order to, you know, employ best management practices for the resource. For the other islands, I suspect that we have very similar things going on. There's still you know, at least another career's worth of research to be done to really define, uh, better define, and really add more detail to these processes that we now know are occurring. Next, we're with researcher Nicole Lotz, looking at samples from deep underground and learning how various rock forms affect the flow and storage of freshwater underground. The projects I, I work on involve trying to understand Hawaii's groundwater systems from sort of precipitation to so source to, to flow and storage of, of our groundwater. That's one component of my research. And another is looking at um, a renewable energy source that's linked to groundwater for the state. Well, more and more, we just need to focus our work on, on very practical applications like you know, what's going to happen to our groundwater supply as the climate changes, as popula population continues to grow? Well, we need to understand where our water is coming from, where it's stored, how it flows, because as population grows, contamination, contamination issues arise. Is groundwater the source of most of our drinking water in the islands? Yes, absolutely. So this image, all the yellow dots are water wells in the state of Hawaii. And those are not research wells, those are wells that we're using to get, get water for water. people's use. Yes. Wow. There's so many. There's 5,000 plus. Wait, say that again? There's close to 6,000, well over 5,000 water wells in the state. Most of them are on Oahu. Because the Hawaii surface, most of the surface of our islands is covered with highly permeable lava flows, and so when it rains, that rainwater can trickle down into the earth and become groundwater very easily. And that explains why Hawaii does not have a large amount of surface water. Surface water requires that there's some impermeable clay or soil that keeps the water buffered up on the surface, and we don't have a lot of that here in the islands. I mean, this is an example of core. The core is actually the interior of a very thick lava flow. So the base of this piece of rock is 42 feet into a single massively thick lava flow. Um, and so you can imagine groundwater hitting this is not going to be able to flow through it. Things like this and then dike material, which is the name for magma that gets trapped in the subsurface that similarly has no vesicularity, will really have an impact on the direction groundwater flows you can piece together by studying the core the whole eruptive history of the volcano in addition to gaining insight into the subsurface hydrology. This is Ooh. all the boxes of drill core for two different drilling projects are downloadable on the site from top to bottom in the earth. So at the top drilling was through a scoria cone and that's this red material, reddish material. So all those pictures are from a single Core. From a single core, yes. Wow. So this says box one and two. So yeah, this is at the surface, and this is the top in this box, and this is the bottom of this box. If we just scroll through this, we can start to see some interesting things. So know that as I scroll down, we're getting deeper and deeper in the earth. Wow, so it, there's the kind of rubble and rocks, and then some more solid core, and then more rubble and rock. Right. The layering of different rock types underground helps to explain the finding of fresh water 10,000 feet below sea level, a discovery that points to the need for continued water resources research as scientists, engineers, economists, cultural practitioners, farmers, and the community come together to understand, protect, and conserve fresh water one of our most precious natural resources. Thanks for watching Voice of the Sea. The University of Hawaii Sea Grant College Program. Helping coastal communities of Hawaii and the Pacific. Through research, education, and outreach.
serving the community, from elementary to graduate students. Hawaii Secret.